I'm Gordon Earl of Albert Einstein College of Medicine. Thanks for joining us. On this segment of Einstein On, we're discussing the threat of bioterrorism and what is being done to address it at the College of Medicine and elsewhere. Joining me to discuss these issues is Dr. Arturo Casadevall, the Leo and Julia Forsheimer Professor and Chair of Microbiology and Immunology at Einstein. He is also Deputy Director of the Northeast Biodefense Center. Dr. Casadevall, thank you for being here. Thank you. On your faculty profile page, you write the following, quote, perhaps the most important medical advance in history was the reduction in deaths by infectious diseases in the 20th century. You cite improvements in sanitation, vaccines, and antibiotics, among other things. Then you write the following, quote, unfortunately, the last two decades have witnessed a return of infectious diseases as a major contributor to death and illness. Could you explain that? That is correct. Um, we have had the return of infectious diseases uh, in really uh, four areas. One of them has been the emergence of new pathogens that we did not know. An example was HIV, which hit us in the mid-1980s completely out of the blue. Another one where we averted a major problem was SARS coronavirus a few years ago. The second major problem has been the re-emergence of diseases that we thought were gone, like tuberculosis, that has now come back with drug resistance forms that are very, very difficult to treat. The third problem has been the emergence of resistance on many of these diseases that we, bacterial diseases that we thought we had conquered, such that we now don't have antibiotics for treating some infectious diseases that we could treat 20 years ago. And medical progress continues to generate many immunocompromised patients, and these people are at high risk for many infectious diseases. And finally, we are now dealing with the, you, the malevolent use of microbes as weapons of war and as bioterrorism, which introduces a whole new specter of threat to humanity. Let's, let's talk about that a little bit. Uh, we all remember the anthrax attacks in 2001. How worried are you that anthrax will be used as a weapon again? I'm very worried, and in fact, I'm surprised that it hasn't happened. It's rel relatively easy to make spores that can be used. And I think that um, given the many uh, groups in the world that are determined to use terrorism to uh, further their cause, uh, it is somewhat surprising that uh, biological weapons have not been used, thank God. Is anthrax uh, the likely choice of a weapon to be used, either because of its ease of making or whatever? I think that it is a, a, likely, a likely weapon because it's been demonstrated to be very effective already. Uh, five, six envelopes caused tremendous amount of disruption to the United States society in 2001. Uh, and however, uh, bacillus, and when you say the word anthrax, we're really referring to bacillus and traces which is a bacteria, anthrax is the disease, but I would say that there are over 100 agents that could be used uh, in terms of biological warfare. And I, I remind you that um, the first known biological warfare incident in the United States was the deliberate uh, contamination of salad bars with salmonella in the Pacific Northwest in the early 80s. Um, in terms of the ANSAC research in your lab, what are you concentrating on? We concentrate in making better vaccines and making antidotes. Our entire effort is dedicated towards devising means to protect society against the next attack. How soon can we get a vaccine? We have a vaccine already. The problem with the current vaccine is that it doesn't work very well. So our efforts are devoted into making better vaccines. Uh, how long will it take? Uh, well, we have candidates. I think that the, one of the challenges is, to develop, is the development of these vaccines, hopefully without having to test them. They have to work the first time because there is no anthrax out there that you could do a clinical trial. What else are you working on at your lab in terms of biological warfare? Only, only bacillus and traces. We do have a, a, um, a program against uh, developing a vaccine against mycobacterium tuberculosis, which in the very resistant form is considered one of the agents, uh, at least uh, priority agents for research by the NIH. 
Now, you're also Deputy Director of the Northeast Biodefense Center. What are they working on? They're working on a whole range of microbes. This is a, a consortium. It's NIH funded that works on maybe 10 or 15 very different microbes, ranging from viruses to bacteria to plague to um, uh, pretty much to toxins. And how far along, I know that it's a fairly recent phenomena, uh, how far along are you in terms of actually developing uh, science that can assist in terms of a terrorist attack? Well, at the laboratory level, we have generated antibodies that are potentially can be used for that already. And in the, uh, we have experimental vaccines that could potentially be developed further. All right, so you're making so they, significant progress? Right, I would say significant progress. I would say that at the level of, of um, experimental animals where these things are tested, that we do have candidates. Is, is it fair to say, I know that you're working on it in your lab individually and you're also working with it in terms of the Biodefense Center, that this has to be a collaborative effort of many universities uh, given the seriousness of the problem and the amount of science that has to go into this to produce a solution. I, I, I cannot agree with you more. And furthermore, development of this is something that inevitably have to be done by the government because there is, this is not done by pharmaceutical industry since there is no market. Right. Well, by mentioning the word government, you take me to the next uh, phase of my questions because the government is attempting to control bioterrorism uh, through select agents and toxins list. I'd like you to talk a little bit about that because in the development of that list, and you've written a paper, of the benefits of that list and the disadvantages. Could you tell me first about the benefits of developing such a list? So what the list was done in the, in the uh, aftermath of 9-11 and what uh, the government did is to convene experts and they try to identify what they thought were the most dangerous microbes and toxins. And the idea was uh, to limit their availability. That is, if you could put in precautions in laboratories and things like that uh, of people that were working on it, that you would likely reduce the threat to society from these agents. So one of the advantages of the list is that at least where the agents are work with, that, that is universities, industrial places, et cetera, that there is now a great deal more of control. But you also have some reservations. And before we get to the specific reservations, I know, I believe that two of the strains on the list, you have the influenza A virus strain from 1918, I believe that's on the list. Mm -hmm. And also smallpox, I believe, is on the list. Is that correct? That's correct. Are they deservedly on the list? Well, smallpox is deservedly on the list. Smallpox is available, presumably, in only two places. That is, in the, at the CDC and in Moscow. That is the last two places Therefore, this is an agent that cannot be obtained from the environment anymore. Therefore, it makes great sense to, to restrict access to it in a way that it cannot get out. I think that makes a great deal of sense now. The other agents is a completely other matter. Many of the other agents are found in the environment. For example, we have anthrax outbreaks in cattle all the time. There is one continuing outbreak in, the, in, in Canada, has been going on for a while. Uh, so these are agents that can be recovered from the environment without much, necessarily much expertise. And in those situations, they should not be on the list in your view? Well, I would say that placing them on the list creates uh, major hurdles to research. Are there any documented cases where the list we've been talking about has actually interfered with research? Well, I can, I can describe my own laboratory. Yes, please. Uh, for example, we have been, we wanted, we work with Bacillus and Traces, which is the agent of anthrax, and the, the, we have been trying to do experiments with the capsule of it, and all the strains that have capsule are select agents, so it's delayed us many, many years to do this. You talked about things, we've talked about things that are not on the list. Let me mention some of them to you and get your reaction to them. SARS is an example, is that right? So SARS is an example of something that is not on the list that is being, they're considering putting on the list. And one of the sobering thoughts there is, is that humanity scored an enormous victory with SARS. SARS came out of nowhere, spread to all the continents, and yet was contained. 
think about about that. Within a year, it was contained. Within a year, we had antidotes. Within a year, we knew what the virus was. That required a tremendous amount of cooperation, collaboration, and sharing of isolates. If you put agents like that on the list, you cannot do that again. You could not share the isolates that easily. And when you're dealing with an epidemic, days can matter. So that would be one situation where society will pay a huge price for putting something on a list. Some of the things that, that I believe are not on the list, I just want your reaction to, if you, if you care to give them one, would be HIV or the polio virus or bacterium responsible for drug-resistant TB, those kinds of things. Anything well, you I want mean, to say they, about that? They're all they're very interesting examples. If you think about HIV from the point of view of a weapon, it's a weapon that can take down societies. The United States considers HIV to be uh, of, of national um, security concerns given that is how this destabilized Africa. When you're talking about populations that as many as a quarter of the people are infected with HIV, yet you don't think about it as a biological weapon because it takes a long time for uh, infection to translate into disease. Yet if you look at it from the point of view of taking out a continent, it is it, it, you can think of it almost as a weapon. Now, I don't advocate putting any of these things on any list, but I do think that there are, it is, it is interesting how some agents made it into the list and some agents did not make it into the list. Now, I don't want to scare our audience, but um, I do, you know, the question of what keeps you up at night. It sounds like HIV does. It sounds like anthrax does. What else keeps you up at night and really worries you? Actually, to me, the, the greatest terrorist is nature, is not fellow humans. With international travel, with the enormous amount of, of globalization, the emergence of an agent can spread throughout the world very rapidly. We saw that with SARS. So if you look at the last 30 years, look since 1980, all the agents that have come out, uh, HIV, SARS, numerous viruses, drug resistance TB, to me, what keeps me up at night is one of these agents making a jump from an animal reservoir to human reservoir and disseminating very rapidly. I read somewhere that a single case of smallpox today would be considered an emergency. Absolutely. A single case. And it will be, it will be not only an emergency, it would, be a, it would require tremendous resources to contain it. Should we uh, destroy existing stockpiles of smallpox? You know, that is a, uh, that's a very, very difficult question. Personally, if it can be kept safe, I would say no. Because I just don't think, and this is at a personal, moral level, the idea of destroying another species. Uh, I have some problems with it. And no one really knows how much is out there. Right. And also that we, can, we may need it in order to make vaccines in the future or something like that. So I say that if we can keep it safe, there is no case for it. Well, being the good scientist that you are, I know that you're able to analyze the situation but also produce remedies. And you do have recommendations on what to do with the list. Could you go through your recommendations briefly with us here? So the first thing I would do to the list is I would shorten it. Agents that are found in the environment that can be readily obtained from the environment, it is difficult to justify putting them on the list, unless you're going to use the list only for, li for law uh, enforcement purposes. W one of the advantages of the list from law enforcement purposes is that just having the agent puts you in the other side of the law. That is, you don't have to prove intent. That's very important if you, if you want to prosecute. On the other hand, you're also paying, I will go back to paying the price for a, in case of potential epidemics, work not getting done, et cetera, et cetera. What else can we do to improve the list? So the other thing that could be done is the list treats, within a, within a species, the list treats highly virulent and not highly virulent the same. Yet we know that within any, any microbial species, there are many variants that are not very virulent. So one of the things that they could do right away is making a lot of those variants immediately available. A lot of work could go on. Now, is anyone going to listen to your recommendations and make I, a change? I think so. I think actually that the people 
who create the list, the government, they're very, very well intentioned and that they want to do what's right. And I think the list was created initially at a time it was a reaction. And as time goes on, we begin to see the benefits and the debits of it. And I have no doubt that these things get, are getting reevaluated. It seems as though there's a fair amount to be worried about, but the fact is, is there some optimism to be conveyed in this environment? I mean, the central message that I, I would like people to take away with is that biological weapons are real, that we live in a world where terrorist attacks occur every day. We have car bombs, airplane bombings, um, microbes are weapons, and there is a probability that they will be used in the future. However, I would also um, want people to know that a lot of work has been done since 9-11, that there is a lot more preparedness in place, that drugs have been developed since then, that vaccines have been developed since 9-11, that the country and the world is much better prepared to deal with this, and that if this does happen, I do believe that we, and by we we mean society and humanity, will be able to deal with it in, in, a, in a much better way. And on that note, we'll uh, thank you for joining us and, and hope you'll come back. Thank you. Come back.